I'm Bob Borston. Uh, I'm Director of Policy Communications here at the Google Washington office, which we fondly call the Geek Patrol on the Potomac. We welcome you all here. Um, I thank you for coming to this, which is the first event in what will be a partnership between Google and the National Journal talking about politics and citizen involvement uh, in our government that will uh, take place over the next uh, year and more. Uh, as I look around this crowd, I do know some of you. Uh, I am impressed by the energy and the intellect that we have gathered here. I'm also somewhat relieved at the thought that uh, not too many people that I see will actually uh, go from the campaign and work in the next government. Uh, that makes me happy. Um, the ground rules for today. In case it's not obvious from the bloggers sitting around, we are on the record here. So if you don't want to say anything, please be quiet. If you don't want it to appear anywhere, don't say anything. Um, we've asked panelists not to make statements and to keep their answers to questions really short. And that means when we get to the question time, we'd also uh, ask you to do the same thing. Uh, no speeches, no discourses. We have a place in Washington uh, for that. It's called Congress. Um, let me turn now to the subject of today's debate, which is the election and the impact of the internet on what we are calling the first 21st century election. We're 142 days away from the election that has already changed American politics. And this is a transforming election, uh, at least when it comes to the media, that we haven't really seen since the election of 1960. We call this the first 21st century campaign and the important thing here is that the American people have already proved right de Gaulle's maxim that politics is far too serious to be left to the politicians. We at Google think that's a really good thing. We're going to hear a lot today about technology, and I'm going to defer to all of the experts you'll hear from about that. Uh, my last proper campaign was in 1992. Uh, we had technology back then, too. Some of you may fondly recall the fax machine. Uh, but it's really uh, today about the people who use that technology, how they've used it, and what it's meant to our political process. A few words about Google. Uh, at Google, we're involved in the political process for a simple reason. Informed participation, we believe, is a good thing. It strengthens our democracy. So what are we doing? Well, first, we're trying to provide more information that will hopefully educate voters. Everything at Google begins with search, and that's proved true for millions and millions of Americans and people from overseas who have gone online to learn about who they think the next American president should be. At Google and YouTube, we've opened up our platforms to help candidates and voters have more and better access to information, to videos, to news, to whatever they're looking for. And during the primaries, we certainly saw how technology could change the dynamics of debate in the YouTube CNN debates that we did. And we've announced our plan to carry that on, to continue to break down barriers between candidates and voters with what we hope will be a debate in New Orleans come September. We're also about increasing participation. We're very excited about a project that we're involved with with the Pew Char Charitable Trust and the secretaries of states throughout the country, which will help standardize election information through what we call the Voter Information Project. The simplest way to tell you about this project is that when it's done, any American will be able to go uh, on a computer or on their mobile phone and find out where they're supposed to vote and who's on the ballot and what the hours are and all the things that you need to do to actually participate. We're also working to increase participation in the political conventions and to help bring them into the 21st century. Don't everybody laugh about that thought. Uh, and to give new media in Denver, in St. Paul, and voters around the country a front row seat for what will transpire there. Finally, uh, we're about helping campaigns. Uh, in the back of this room, there's some great demonstrations of our map gallery that profiles the way that people in this room and people around the country have used our geo geographic products to help display political information. The secret is basically out. 
on who your neighbor is giving money to, if you look at the Huffington Post, for example. And uh, I urge you to go look at these programs. We are also handing out some information today on what we like to call campaign in a box, all the simple tools that we can provide for campaign managers and others who want to get involved. Uh, with that, let me just say that this would not be a political conversation in 2008 without talking about YouTube. So let me turn it over to Steve Grove, the political director from YouTube. Steve. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank you all for coming here today. It's a real honor to see all of you out here in the crowd. Several faces out there I know have been very active on YouTube, uh, as have all of our panelists today. And it's really been fascinating to see both campaigns and pundits and regular citizens innovate uh, with video in this election. I think it's fundamentally changed the media ecosystem that we see today. I was talking to James Kotecki uh, before the panel here today, uh, the guy who was once emergency cheese, a guy in his bedroom commenting on uh, the campaign trail from his, uh, his dorm room, uh, now is a reporter for uh, the Politico. It used to be that he was a rarity to have uh, you know, a college student commenting on politics uh, and getting some attention for it was a rarity. Now we see 20, 30, 40 political commentators in their dorm rooms uh, from all over the country in, in every state. Um, you know, whereas once the Makaka video was this aberration, uh, th this gotcha video that, that changed everything, now we essentially see almost a gotcha video every day on YouTube. Um, and when it was once uh, seen as really neat and unique to announce your presidential campaign on YouTube and post a few videos, we now see campaigns putting up two or three videos a day, essentially creating their own documentaries of what's taking place in the campaign trail on YouTube. So it's been fascinating for us to see uh, both campaigns, but also citizens and uh, news organizations innovate with these technologies. And I think, as you see today, uh, they'll be the best spokespeople for, for how that works and what they've learned and, and what that means for the future of, of elections in this country. Um, it's an honor to turn it over to Jim Barnes, our partner from the National Journal, who will speak uh, uh, to the National Journal's view of all this. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I'm Jim Barnes, political correspondent with the National Journal, and I want to thank uh, Google for hosting this event, and I want to thank all of you for joining us today, especially our panelists. All presidential campaigns are not created equal, and every once in a generation or so, a big election framed by big social changes comes along. The forces that are shaping today's election may be most analogous to the ones that shaped the election of 1960. For the first time in 1960, the number of Americans who lived in suburbs equaled the number who lived in cities. The baby boomers were just beginning to come of age and shape American culture and the immense changes that would follow in the ensuing decade. Technology was also changing American society and the nation's politics. In 1950, only 4.4 million American households had a television set. By 1960, 45 million homes in America had TV, and this new medium was transforming the country's political landscape. The continental theater of candidates campaigning at whistle-stop tours or in ticker tape parades was shrinking into a 19-inch cathode ray tube around which some 70 million Americans gathered to watch the first presidential debate between Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy. The great chronicler of presidential campaigns, Theodore H. White, later observed, all politics has changed to fit this stage. I dare say if White was with us today, he might think that the, political, that the political stage is changing once more. Today, the country is, is undergoing dramatic demographic change, this time fueled by immigration. The distinctions of people living in suburbs versus cities versus rural areas seem less profound given the impact that globalization is having on our entire population. Likewise, we've experienced technological change. In 1997, the first year that the census attempted to measure internet access in homes, it found that only 18% of US households had access to the net. Today, the research firm of Parks Associates estimates that only 18% of US households doesn't have access to the internet. These forces have led to what some have called the first postmodern campaign, what others have termed the first 
campaign, the first campaign of the 21st century, which is the title of this conference. Politics, we contend that politics has changed and that we're never going to go back to the 20th century campaign. Just one example, campaign finance. It's hard to imagine that when we're assessing presidential candidates in 2012, the only question we'll ask is, how many bundlers do you have? How many pioneers do you have? In the future, the first question may well be, how much money can you raise on the net? Today, we're going to explore that future and look at how technology is changing the way we cover and organize campaigns and the, imba and the impact of popular culture on our politics. So thank you for joining us for what I think is going to be a very enlightening afternoon. And I'll ask Judy Woodruff and our first panel to come on up here. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here uh, with everybody uh, for more than two reasons, but two main reasons. For one, I've been covering presidential campaigns since 1976. And they've all been unpredictable, but I have to say this has been the most exciting one uh, I've ever seen. And number two is somebody who has had to learn about the internet from my children. Uh, for me to be doing a panel at Google, there's a certain amount of irony. Uh, but having said that, uh, I've, I know I've learned a lot. I still have a lot to learn, and I'm really excited to be here as part of this panel. Uh, what we're going to be talking about now, as Jim just said, is, is how this election and other elections in the 21st century are being covered, what the new media is doing that's helpful, what it's doing that's harmful, and everything in between. And I want to introduce this terrific lineup of panelists uh, to help me talk about it. Uh, starting all the way on my right, on your left, Mark Halperin is the editor-at-large and senior political analyst for Time. His blog, The Page, is must-reading for anybody watching this campaign. Before Time, Mark was at ABC News for 20 years, where he served as political director for the last 10 of those. He continues as a political analyst for ABC. Seated next to Mark is Mary Catherine Hamm. She's an editor and a blogger with a background in both the mainstream media and conservative politics. She graduated from the University of Georgia in 2002. She's risen quickly since then through the ranks. She won awards for newspaper reporting. She jumped to the Heritage Foundation to edit the Insider Magazine print and online. From there to Hugh Hewitt's townhall.com, where she is now managing editor. Next to her, James Kotecki. He graduated from Georgetown University just one year ago, but he's already a figure in online journalism. He started web commentaries for YouTube as an undergraduate. He hosted six presidential candidates for video interviews in his dorm room. He has been called by The Economist magazine, quote, probably the world's foremost expert on YouTube videos posted by presidential candidates. And he is now the writer, producer, and host of Kateki TV, an online video series at politico.com. Next to James is Phil Singer, joining us from the other side of the political fence. Phil, until just a couple of days ago, served as Hillary Clinton's deputy communications director. He bears the loving scars from that effort. Uh, before that, he was with John Kerry's uh, campaign in 2004. He was, before that, communications director for the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, and before that, Senator Chuck Schumer's press secretary. This week, we can tell you he is starting a new company of his own called Marathon Strategies. And finally, next to me, Kevin Madden, who served most recently as National Press Secretary and Senior Communications Strategist for Governor, uh, Governor Mitt Romney in his presidential campaign. Prior to joining Governor Romney, uh, Kevin served as press secretary to House Majority Leader John Boehner, as communications director for House Majority Leader Tom DeLay, and before that he worked at the Justice Department in Public Affairs and as a campaign spokesman for President Bush uh, in his reelection effort in 2004. So with that, let's jump into the conversation. We've asked our three media representatives uh, to kick this off by talking for two or three minutes, starting with you, Mark, uh, looking at what effect you think the media is having in terms of uh, both helping both as, a, as an opportunity and as a challenge in your efforts to cover this campaign. Mark Halperin. Thank you, Judy. Thank you all for coming and, and for including me. Uh, I'm going to try to not use even two of my minutes, let alone three, so, so Kevin and <laughs> Phil can have more time. Um, I think uh, you know, Judy used words opportunities and challenges, and those are good political words because candidates don't like to talk about problems. 
Um, but let me just give you, uh, because uh, to, to show that I think uh, there are still a lot of challenges, uh, let me give you two things that I think are positive that we've seen and three that I think are negative that, that uh, we all need to work on. Um, the two positive ones that I think um, people since the dawn of the internet have predicted, um, but that we definitely see and, and, and are great are the opportunity for anyone to publish, for people to communicate uh, freely, to have a real democratization of the coverage of presidential elections and politics in general. I think it's, it is fantastic and, and we're seeing more of it and, and it being done better than it's ever been done. Uh, and I think the, the increase from 2004 has been, uh, has been geometric in that arithmetic. It's, it's been incredible. The second thing is you see stories now that you otherwise would not have seen. I don't know that there's an example this cycle as clear as, as the story debunking uh, CBS's story about President Bush's National Guard records, but there have been plenty of stories that just simply would not otherwise have existed, both online and also driving old media to follow up on stories, and I think that's an incredibly valuable thing. Let me talk about three challenges that I see that I think are problems, and, and these have increased as well since 2004, and I find them uh, more troubling this cycle than I did four years ago when I found them pretty troubling. One is uh, that the voices uh, that, that in new media tend to be angry, I find, on both sides. They tend to be personal. They tend to not necessarily um, be uh, contributing to the public dialogue in a way that I find to be productive or the highest and best of America. Second, despite the fact that many websites attack old media as celebrating the trivial and the gossipy and horse race and polls, I find a lot of those same sites that attack old media for that are the leading purveyors of those things. And I don't see, uh, I don't see people uh, criticizing them generally uh, or criticizing within the old new media world. And finally, I think you see uh, in, in new media a great success and rising market share. But there's a real problem because as old, new media is taking market share from old media, old media is increasingly unable to afford to do the kind of serious journalism that a democracy needs. File Freedom of Information Act requests, send reporters out on the road regularly, not just sporadically, to listen to the candidates every day, long-term investigative pieces. That is not a problem that new media uh, should be blamed for but it's a result of the declining market share of old media to new media. And I think as a democracy, we have to find a solution to that. There are some efforts underway now that are, are, are trying to address it, but it's a real problem. All right, Mark, thank you. Mary Catherine uh, Ham, what about uh, uh, opportunities and challenges that the new media well, I, sh I should first off, uh, let me correct my affiliation, which just changed yesterday. So that's why uh, <laughs> I'm with me. Examiner, uh, the Washington Examiner now, DC Examiner, revamping the website. and. Uh, and launching some new tools going into the 08 election. So I apologize for that not getting all the way through the, the, the lines of co communication. New media just doesn't move fast enough, apparently. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the angry new media, <laughs> Mark. No, and I, I think there are a couple things. Um, first off, as far as opportunities, I think we have seen a democratization of the, of the media process. And I love that on the left and right. I love it the Huffington Post breaks really good news. I love it the folks on the right do the same thing and can you know, knock down stories like the CBS National Guard story when it's necessary. Um, a lot of that can be clouded by what was, Mark was talking about with the sort of angry rhetoric that sometimes can go overboard, especially in comment sections. Um, and I think there's a risk with new media of, of us overshadowing the good work that we do um, with getting sort of blustery and angry uh, when, when not always necessary. But as far as the democratization goes, I think it's wonderful that new media gives citizens the opportunity to become reporters, and then on the old media side, actually gives reporters the opportunity to become personalities. Um, I think in 2004, fewer people would have been familiar with Mark Halpern's name and sort of known the kind of guy he was, because once you start into a new media format where you're blogging and you're kind of communicating with people on a daily basis, I think they get a better idea of where you're coming from. I think it's a great way to build trust with people who stay in touch with you every day, see the kind of person you are, and use that as a gauge for deciding what, if what you write is what you know, they trust from you. Um, so I think that's an, a great opportunity both for old and new media. On, on the new media side, you see it with uh, Mayhill Fowler, I believe is her name, who broke the, um, the story about Obama's bitter comments when she was at a fundraiser. She also, um, she also caught uh, Bill Clinton mouthing off about uh, the Vanity Fair piece and has broken some really neat stories. 
Um, on the right side, you have a, a woman like Jennifer Rubin, who actually writes for Commentary Magazine now, but started as just a mom who was interested in politics. And uh, she was actually the one who got the Hamas endorsement uh, for Obama, Hamas endorsement for Obama into the uh, political conversation by bringing it up on a blogger phone call. So I think there's opportunities, uh, certainly, in the democratization. Uh, I think the challenge, one of the main challenges for me, um, on both sides is keeping up with the tide. I think right now, while we're sitting on this panel, we're missing approximately 87,000 stories breaking. <laughs> is that right? And I don't have my BlackBerry with me, so it's even more. Um, it can get overwhelming, I think, sort of drinking from the fire hose, and, uh, and then keeping up with new tools. There are, there are many, many ways, I think, probably most, even us on this stage who spend our lives doing this, to create and communicate news that are new ways every single day that we're not necessarily keeping up with because we're also trying to follow the 87,000 stories. So that's one of the huge challenges for me. Okay, and thanks for the update on your yeah. career. I apologize for that not getting <laughs> through. Right. James Kotecki. So coming at it from a little bit of a different perspective, um, just let me kind of tell you my own story and where I see the, where I kind of personally saw the opportunities and challenges. I started off making videos in my dorm room at Georgetown University the second semester that I was there. And I started talking about how presidential candidates were using YouTube officially in their campaigns, this very narrow topic. And the reason that I did it was not because I wanted to be a journalist and not necessarily because I had a calling to do that. I did it because I wanted people to watch my videos on YouTube. Um, I did it just because I thought it'd be fun to build an audience on YouTube. I saw a lot of people doing it, and I thought, all right, I'll try talking about something that I love, I'm very interested in, and I think I have something to say about. So I started making these videos. Eventually that led, as, as Judy mentioned, to some presidential candidates coming to my dorm room to do interviews, and that was fun. Even then, I didn't consider myself really a journalist. And it wasn't until later when I read this online forum, this discussion about is James Kotecki a journalist or not, with some people very angry on both sides talking about whether I was or not, that I realized that I, I guess I was doing some kind of journalistic type things. And so, the, and what I realized from that conversation though was that it didn't really matter whether I was a journalist or not, or whether I saw myself as that or not, it didn't really matter. Because what I was doing was just something that I thought was fun and I would keep doing it just like I was doing it, whether people gave me a certain label or not. So I think the opportunity for me was unlimited because I could never have started doing anything in my dorm room and gotten this kind of popularity or, or publicity in any other way except for YouTube. But, and, the, and the challenge was basically just getting my name out there and getting seen. And I think the other thing that's either an opportunity or a challenge, depending on what side of the fence you're on, is um, should I be doing this? Should you be listening to me? Am I a credible person or not? Uh, obviously, I would say yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, now let's give a, a, a chance, give the, the uh, two representatives of, of the, uh, uh, the candidates a chance to respond and talk about uh, opportunities and challenges of getting your message out uh, in the new media. And start with you, Phil. Um, I think that the new media has actually revolutionized, obviously, the way campaigns are run. But what it's done with particular regard, there's been a lot of discussion about how journalists are adapting to new media environments. I don't think there's been as much discussion about how campaigns are adapting in terms of how they approach um, advancing or promoting a message. And one of the things that you know, we started to do on the Clinton campaign, I think that you know, going down, you know, each cycle, campaigns have gotten more and more involved in terms of how they utilize the internet. For example, in 04, blogs were just beginning. Um, I don't think that, you know, Certainly, you know, the Kerry campaign, I think, was, you know, groundbreaking in that we had, I think, someone who's going to be up on, on the, next, uh, the next panel who focused on blogs. But I don't think that we, we, we fully appreciated the power of the Internet in terms of moving and, and amplifying a message as much as we should have back in 04. In 06, that obviously started to change significantly um, as blogs took on a greater role. And um, it started to become par for the course to, you know, if uh, Trent Lott was on hardball and made some sort of outrageous comment, we would pull down a, uh, a snippet and YouTube that and send that around and get that out to, uh, to press. And suddenly, cable TV appearances uh, where a comment that might have come and gone suddenly took on greater resonance and would get injected into the, into the, the sphere. In 08, what we tried to do on the Clinton campaign, and again, I, you know, I think as future cycles uh, uh, take place, people will expand and improve upon that. But we tried to uh, recognize the internet as an opportunity not just to place something on a place like the page or in Politico or uh, a news blog, 
but rather to create our own uh, entities where we could promote a message, a message. So for example, we created something called the Hillary Hub, which was not unlike the page in its format or presentation, but we would try to use the Hillary Hub, for example, to, if we were driving a big healthcare message on a given Tuesday, we would take a, either a press release, a snippet from, her, uh, from Senator Clinton's speeches, or a favorable curtain raiser story, whatever it was, link to that story, put a, uh, you know, a, hopefully what was a, an attention grabbing headline up on there, a nice graphic or a photo, um, and we would use that, uh, that Hillary Hub as a way to uh, try to drive our message, and we would direct you know, old media, new media, everyone we could to that site and try to hammer the point home. Um, other times we would use the Hillary Hub to try to break news. I think we put uh, one of our fundraising announcements up there one day. We had a big money bag uh, graphic as the, uh, the visual. Um, uh, uh, related to that point, one of the things we did, um, going to one of the things that somebody, had, uh, somebody said about knocking down stories, when uh, we, we, had, we had something called the Fact Hub. We were very big into hubs on the Hillary campaign. Um, <laughs> but we had something called the Fact Hub, and we launched the Fact Hub, I think it was back in July, um, the same day that NPR reported that uh, our campaign had done a uh, visit to a diner, ordered a bunch of cheeseburgers and shakes and food, and didn't leave a tip for the, uh, uh, the server who, uh, who waited on us. And the report aired on NPR at about 7.45 that morning. We heard about this, obviously, as we were all you know, assembling for our morning meetings and whatnot. And you know, the second we heard about it, we said, this can't be true. We went and checked it out. Sure enough, we had the receipts and the documentation t to show that we, had left, uh, that we had left a tip. And we, we had had this site in the works, but we decided to launch it that day. We launched it. We put up the, uh, the correction or the fact check, if you will. Um, and we used that to help drive, uh, you know, correction stories that were online that day. And... Um, uh, we've utilized, we use, utilize that site as a tool day in and day out you know, for the last however many months to try to ensure that whatever you know, incorrect statement was out there, we were able to correct in real time. And at other times, it eventually grew into a device that we used to correct other, uh, you know, our rival candidates, for example, who might have said something inaccurate about their record. We would say, well, let's fact check that. And we would put that up. Debates, we would use that site as a uh, an information depot where we could uh, correct the record. So I think going forward, what I think a lot of campaigns are going to be doing is creating their own websites that will, in some respects, compete with old media and new media. Um, and I remember one of the things that reporters used to say to me all the time when we first launched these sites was, are you guys going to use these to break news? And it was almost as though we were you know, causing the, uh, the other reporters to become obsolete. Um, and uh, I think in part, we ended up not using it as much, partly for that reason. We didn't want to antagonize people. I think there's a happy balance um, with regard to using too much on your site at the expense of cultivating relationships with the people who cover you. But um, certainly, we saw some utility um, in using that, uh, that process to advance our message and, and promote our cause. OK, great. Kevin Madden, uh, the Romney campaign, he just refreshed my memory, wrapped up on February the February the 7th, 7th uh, only a couple of days ago. <laughs> is any of what? Uh, I haven't got any sleep since because I, I have a new baby, a one month old baby. So it's, uh, it's, I'm getting worse sleep hours than I did when I was on the campaign. So does any of what Phil is saying uh, sound familiar? in terms of what you guys were doing. Yeah, I mean, I'll be, I'll be very brief uh, just so we can get to the, the Q&A session, but uh, just to follow up on what Phil said, uh, the, what new media allows you to do on a campaign is operate with a higher level of speed and precision than you could in, in, uh, when you were just dealing with the old media. Now, the flip side of that is that your opponents, if they utilize those same tools correctly, can um, destroy your message and slow down any momentum that you have. Uh, because what happens is it essentially, with the right type of approach, you can essentially shatter your opponent's ability to keep their message together and to do so uh, in a precise way. I remember uh, talking when I went up to meet with Governor Romney about the prospects of joining his campaign. Um, it was during the time where, if you remember, John Kerry had this meltdown about saying that you could get stuck in Iraq. I'm sure everybody remembers that. And it was being played over and over and over on YouTube, and then it essentially had um, metastasized to a major cable news story every single day talking about John Kerry and how it was going to affect the, o, uh, the 06 elections. And so I'm sitting there with Governor Romney, and he's just, you know, oh, boy, YouTube, it's, this is 
a scary thing. You know, uh, what's it going? What, tell me about it. How do you how do you deal with this sort of thing? And I said, well, actually, uh, you know, you can build a infrastructure that can help you integrate your messages across not only YouTube, using YouTube new media technologies across old media technologies like radio and television and newspaper. Uh, and uh, he said, well, how do you do that? And I said, hire me and I'll tell you. <laughs> So, um, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's, uh, the, with that uh, speed and precision that you get, it also carries many dangers uh, because in a, in a world where information uh, mobility is, so, is, is changing so rapidly, it can just as quickly destroy your message of the day as much as it can help you disseminate it. Chal uh, balancing those two challenges is what Phil and I did probably every single day during this 08 campaign. Well, let me come back to Mark on one of the points that uh, I think that Phil made about creating. The candidates are now able to create their own websites. He talked about Hillary uh, Hub, uh, Fact.Hub, and the rest of it. Uh, how does that make it easier to get information? Harder to distinguish? You know, what's information that's vetted? What's coming straight from the campaign that needs to be vetted? I mean, how does it affect your life? Well, I think that one of the one of the biggest problems now is the, the view that the public has of people in journalism. As James suggested, there's, there's ambiguity about what the definition is. But I think it's important in a democracy to have powerful news organizations who are concerned about the public interest, who are not partisan, who are trusted by the public to provide information to help voters and citizens make decisions. The campaigns are smart and, and right to use the technology to get information at themselves. The problem is it's, going to, it, it's something that will contribute, continue to contribute to this blurring of the public and, and what information they can trust. I would say, my guess is that most of the people who went to Senator Clinton's website were people who either agreed with her or a very small percentage of people who went were journalists and an even smaller percentage were opposition researchers for the Obama campaign uh, and, other, and, uh, and, and the Republicans. So it's, it's basically a billboard of infor to get information to supporters, like an email, a blast email, like the way in the old days they would have put out a press release and relied on the media. So I think it's great for the campaigns, but it's just another way in which two bad things happen. One I just said about blurring for, for citizens the difference between information that is propaganda or one-sided or meant to influence a debate from one point of view versus information that's done by an organization who has the public interest overall at heart. And the other thing that I think that I think is is it blurs is the uh, ability of of uh, uh, the public to have a communal place where people who disagree come to one place and have a debate. Like I said, I think most people on that site were people who wanted Senator Clinton's information because they were already supporting her. How do you respond to that, Phil? Well, I think first there are, there are differences between the two sites. Fact Hub you know, was specific to driving a particular message on a given day, Fa uh, or Hillary Hub, rather. Fact Hub was actually utilized by quite a few reporters as a resource for um, either getting a response from the Clinton campaign to a certain issue, uh, to a in uh, particular inquiry. You know, for example, um, Senator Obama, during the course of the campaign, would often uh, quote a uh, Hillary comment from New Hampshire Public Radio where, she, where he said she said that Michigan wouldn't count for anything. Uh, we posted the full transcript of that interview where she made it clear that she was concerned about excluding Michigan from the process, and the comment that Senator Obama um, was, was uh, cherry-picking from was actually uh, uh, just a, a statement of fact saying that under the current DNC rules, they are not counting the Michigan delegates. That's a, that's a fact. She wasn't agreeing with that in the context of that interview. She wasn't agreeing with that sentiment. She was merely relaying what was... Uh, what, the, what, that, what, that, what the operative rule was. Um, and so the Fact Hub allowed us to set the record straight, provide the context for the comment, and get that out to reporters. Now, obviously, some reporters you know, utilize the Fact Hub, others don't. It's not, it's not a foolproof method, but it was a, um, it's not simply a propaganda effort um, either. So I think that there's, a, I think the more, and I, I also would just add, I think that the more that these websites are most effective when they veer away from being propaganda machines and try to focus on being just you know, the straight facts on a given issue. Um, I think we're, the old media takes them more seriously when they're that, as opposed to saying, you know, Senator so-and-so is the greatest thing since sliced bread, um, at which point they get discounted and you know, maybe visited once and never visited again. James and Mary Catherine, do you all have any of the same concerns that Mark expressed about the blurring of the lines here? 
I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about the blurring of lines. I think we're moving towards a sort of pro-am model in which, you know, pro-organizations, large media organizations facilitate, in some cases, amateurs reporting on news. Uh, they already do this in a thousand ways by having photos uploaded during disasters and, and having folks on the street where you don't necessarily, ha necessarily have a reporter, partly because of uh, cost cutting and, and you can't necessarily have that many feet on the ground these days. Um, so I think I'm not as concerned about the blurring of the lines. My main thing is sort of a transparency among folks who are reporting the news and being upfront about where you're coming from. And I think part of the issue that the old media runs into, and I think why new media has sort of uh, has taken off, or part of, one of the reasons, is that the public is not sure that it has the public interest in mind, that old media has the public interest in mind. There's a Rasmussen poll that came out this week that shows 17, only 17%, I believe, uh, think that reporters won't be rooting for a certain candidate. Now, it breaks down into which candidate they think they'll be rooting for, but they, they think that that slants coverage. Um, so I think old media has to deal with that. I think new media is a little bit more straightforward about where they're coming from when they're reporting and allows uh, the readers to parse whether they're going to trust different people. As far as uh, campaign sites go, I think there's useful information. Well, let me, on, let me okay. come back. I'd, I'd want yeah, to get, I want Mark to respond to that. I'd like to hear what James has to say. I mean, this, this concern that, well, hey, you know, people in the mainstream media have opinions anyway. They just don't tell us what they are. Well, there's, there's two related challenges for the old media, or for any organization, new or old, that aspires to be serving the public interest. One is to have an economic model that allows you to stay in business and continue to fight for the public interest. If you work in public television, you have to hope that the government continues to fund it. If, you don't work in, if you're not funded by the government, you have to have an economic model in the marketplace that will work. And the problem is, increasingly, people are interested in partisan media, new media, and that's, that's one challenge. If, if we agree as a society we want to have media that's concerned about the public interest. The other is to have more than 17% of Americans think that the media is not biased. And the problem is mostly has been caused by old media and the way we've behaved to convince people on the, on the right for, for most of the last four years and increasingly since the Clinton administration, also on the left, we've brought upon ourselves in old media the, the, the public view that we don't have the public interest at heart and that we are biased. The new media, I think, has exacerbated that by taking market share away from us, by making fun of us and challenging us all the time, and by providing uh, uh, partisans, straightforward partisan information. So if you, if you want a partisan point of view that's unambiguous and unapologetic, you know where to get it. So I think without diminishing the importance or the, or the, the positives of the new media, as I said at the beginning, I think we all should aspire to have clear identities for nonpartisan people, where people are trusted by the public and by elite actors with whom uh, we have to deal and who we cover, and that, and that all the trend lines, I think, are in a bad direction. It's not new media's fault in most cases, but it, does exas it is exacerbating it quite a bit. I just would add a footnote about public uh, broadcasting. Uh, you'd be surprised at how, what a small percentage of our funding comes from the government. Much of it actually comes from, viewers from like individual you. donors and fun found. That's right. <laughs> Thank you, viewers like I watched Charlie. I watched Charlie Rose a lot. <laughs> James, you want to weigh in on this whole question, and then I want Kevin to. Um, it's not that I don't share some of these same concerns, but I tend to take a more rosy view on this. I, I mean, I've, I've never really grown up in a world where there's been this kind of golden standard of, of journalism. And I get the sense from talking to older people, you know, or people that are older than myself, like this, that this one day, in the past, this kind of rosy journalism existed that was great and was kind of balanced, and now it's become much more partisan. And it clearly is very partisan in many ways today, and, and that can definitely be, be a bad thing. But I think a lot of people, like Mary Catherine was talking about, they never really trusted it in the first place. And me being a very kind of cynical, what, what is my generation? Generation Y, I guess? Um, being a cynical Generation Y or a millennial generation person, I never really buy the idea that it was ever nonpartisan in the first place. So I think the rosy thing for me is, at least now, any individual who wants to put a different message out there can do that. And I think that's overall a net positive. Because anybody, like I, I, a kid in a dorm room, can just make videos and say things that make sense to him, and actually that can have some resonance if it has resonance with other people. Um, there's no guarantees of anybody getting their message out there. And as more and more people do this on an individual basis, they're, of course, competing for mind share in the public uh, space. But I think that it's overall uh, a better thing because it can balance out a kind of uh, a, a partisanship, which I think many people believe has kind of, a, not necessarily a partisan politically, but 
a kind of slant that many people believe has always existed. But how important is it to have a foundation of information, sort of facts that everybody can accept? Very, it's, and, it's and very important. And the mainstream important. media has played a, a well, very I, important I would, role. I would add just a very small, is that even though a lot of new media is partisan or ideological, I would argue, is, is more often the case, um, they're either conservative or liberal, uh, a lot of times they are breaking news or using real facts. Uh, and so, you know, a lot, a lot of stories that come out of blogs, although they come out of somewhere where you, you know where that person's coming from, you know they're a liberal, they may be breaking news that's perfectly usable by everyone. And so it's, it's not always affected and by then, their partisanship. Yeah, Mark, I, I, it's, gr it's definitely important not to romanticize the past, but I think there is a difference. Let me, let me take a quick survey. Uh, I'm going to ask you about two things. Raise your hand if you know more about the first one, and then I'm going to ask people who know more about the second one, okay? First, raise your hand. The two things are Obama girl or Barack Obama's health care plan. Raise your hand if you know more about Obama girl. <laughs> and raise your hand if you know more about John, uh, Barack Obama's health care plan than Obama girl. All right. A lot of you are lying, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Still, it's pretty close. I think that, I think that the, the monopoly aspects that existed in the past were not perfect, but it allowed the country to have a national conversation and if something was happening, Watergate, Vietnam, civil rights, something big was happening, there was a serious discussion about it with people who were not trusted by everyone, but who were well-funded by corporations or private entities who believed in a public interest and didn't have to worry about whether they were going to be in business in five years. That's no longer the case. You, you can celebrate all the great things that are happening now, but I think the country needs to be able to have a serious adult national conversation. And if you've got, rather than 10 big organizations, hundreds and thousands of little ones, it's just harder to have that conversation. Well, as the other old person on the panel, I associate myself with, with uh, Mark's remarks. Kevin. I agree with that. I, I think I, I tend to try and be a broker uh, between the new media and old media and try and explain the process, understand it, and then use, you, you, you use it the way I can to help a particular candidate message and ideas. Uh, you know, economists talk about the idea, the economists talk about the, 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 the new economy versus the old economy by calling it a push economy is what we had in past years, and now we're in a pull economy. Well, a push economy it used to be that you go to your retailer and um, at your local hardware store, and the, 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 the manufacturer would be trying to get that retailer to buy all, this, all these widgets and put them on their store shelves. In the pull economy, you have places like Walmart who know exactly how many widgets they have in their store. They know exactly how many people come in to buy those widgets because of new technology. Well, we're in a, in a media world now, in a, in a public information stage, where we have push and pull information economy. And the power is now gone from big media. The power is no longer in the hands of the New York Times, your local uh, affiliate newscast, and uh, and the Walter Cronkites of the world, but instead it's in the power of the, cons the information consumer, the power in the voter, to go and get the information that they want. Whether they want to click on YouTube and see Obama Girl, or whether they want to go on Bar Barack Obama's website and learn about his health care plan. So that's just the reality that we're in right now. Um, I think that it's incumbent upon campaigns to understand that with that with this new information, this poll information economy, that you can go out and, and spread your message, and you can go out and reach new voters. I always call it, we're, and from a press standpoint, I used to say that we're in a send me the link society. Nobody, nobody, you know, when we were kids, I remember my mom used to cut out newspaper articles and post them on the refrigerator so that somebody would read it. That day is gone. Now it's, can you send me the link? Send me the link. Reporters do it all the time. They email you and say, send me the link on Hillary Hub about that, uh, the, for the facts that you're trying to push so I can get it into my story. So uh, rather than taking sides, I, I'm trying to explain it. And I think that rather than the lines being blurred, that instead there is a very clear contrast between old media and new media now, but the voters are more discerning, the information consumers are more discerning about which ones they go to based on their identity politics. Are you saying it doesn't matter to the campaigns whether, whether voters are getting more sort of seri serious policy information about where these candidates stand, or whether they're getting a, he a heavier and heavier diet of the kind of trivia that Mark mentioned, I mean, whether it's Obama girl or something else. I mean, it, does it not matter at all to you as, as working for somebody who wants to be president of the United States? Well, no, I think it matters. What you have to do is essentially uh, understand that process and, and harness it. Um, for example, 
knowing that Governor Romney was going to give a, a policy speech and that uh, it, was, it was very unlikely that maybe the New York Times or somebody would cover it the way I want them to cover it, I have to take the, the, the steps with new media in order to make sure that it gets to a grassroots level so that the people who want more information about Governor Romney, need more information about Romney, can get it. Essentially dominate the market share of information with new media. So rather than having this conversation uh, or giving a speech to a crowd like this with 250 people, look beyond the 250 people, use the technologies that the internet provides, that radio provides, that, uh, that, that, um, uh, that just a simple email or YouTube can provide so to make sure that everybody gets that information instantaneously. Bill? Yeah, I, I don't think that it's, a, it's an issue of old media versus new media. I mean, anybody that wants information about a candidate's health care plan can, can access that information. And anyone that wants to watch the Obama girl video can obviously access that as well. Um, I think the challenge for campaigns, and frankly for journalists as well, is the power of the link. And how do you master the power of links so in a way that allows you to um, inundate the internet with, your, with whatever it is you're, you're trying to spread? Um, you know, from a, you know, a, a, a flax standpoint or vantage point, um, you know, if WashingtonPost.com writes an article up that I want to, that I think is worth, or that makes a point that I think is worth sending around to people, I'll send that around. I'll get a, a, a number of responses from old media you know, reporters who say, oh, I'm not doing anything with this. You know, the WashingtonPost.com has already written it. You know, it's, it's, it's null and void. Or if you, as opposed to other you know, new, newer media type sites like the political blog, like Ben Smith, for example, who might say, huh, I wish I had broken that. But then he'll take that link and then and will either make a comment um, or give his own analysis of whatever it is that you know, I'm sending him and put that up on his site, and then he'll get linked from, uh, you know, to, by another site, and so on and so forth. And so information can spread around that way. And I think the challenge for old media is figuring out a way to um, accept, you know, the, you know, in the old days, if the New York Times broke a story, the next day the Washington Post wouldn't follow it up. Um, on the internet, I don't think it really works that way. I think if somebody now, now you have the caucus, you have yeah. the, the LA Times has a blog, the Chicago Tribune has a blog. Right now, everybody's basically right. you know competing in real time, and you're not waiting for the next day's papers to come out. You know, if the caucus pops pops something up at one o'clock, the LA Times is going to try to chase it and advance it by two o'clock. And so you get into this arms race of sorts where everybody is rushing to outdo the other, and sometimes that leads you in the direction uh, away from a policy speech. Let's say that someone tripped on the steps on the way up to the podium. Suddenly that becomes the big story that everyone's chasing, and what was said at the podium is forgotten. Um, and so that creates this, this, uh, an interesting dynamic that I think the campaigns have to figure out a way to master, and they use the Internet as a way to circumvent that by using links to email and directly contact people. But the old media also needs to figure out a way to say, okay, this is an interesting you know, person tripping up the steps, but let's focus on what was said and to balance that out. All right, and, and we're going to take questions from the audience, and as we do, and we're going to ask you to step to this microphone here on the right when you do, but I, as we do, I want to ask a couple of you to respond to this, this charge that's out there that the, it's the new media and the, the especially the opinion-heavy new media that's contributing to what was already a polar, an increasingly polarized American electorate. James? Uh, yeah, no question. I, and I don't mean to, I don't mean to, to trivial, uh, to like to celebrate the, the trivial aspects at all. I think it even gets beyond technology, just towards human nature, just towards in a in a in a culture where I can see anything that I want to see, and it's all the same cost to me. Uh, I mean, most human beings, I think, will naturally tend towards things that are more entertaining, or more provocative. And if people can wrap their policy messages around a kind of entertaining candy-coated shell. They're often going to do much better, but in many times it's the entertaining things like the Obama girl that have almost you know no policy relevance at all. So I th and I th and I think that the technology that we have kind of accentuates and makes makes the our natural tendency towards wanting to be entertained. It kind of uh, puts that on steroids, and that may not be healthy for society. But I just think that's where we are right now. Okay, you want to step to the microphone, Terry Michael. Thank you, Judy. I uh, run a program that teaches journalism students about politics. At least I think I teach them about politics, tilting at windmills. Um, my question is about something I don't think you've talked about, and that's the aggregator sites, the sites that lead, particularly mainstream media, to other people's reporting, other people's opinion. I think they are somewhat... Give us some examples of those. ...drudge and real clear politics, and that's why my question. Uh, I'm 61. I've been a reporter. I was a press secretary in the dark ages. I've taught journalistic ethics. I teach journalism students about politics, but I have a blog. 
I try to write an essay form instead of multisyllabic rants. Others might disagree. But I have no problem with a million flowers blooming, um, even if they're unvetted for fact. I'm beginning to wonder whether the aggregator sites are not a problem, because I think they're really skewed right. Drudge is obviously conservative. Real clear politics is less obviously neocon, but very neocon. I don't think it exists on the left. Yeah, a lot of opinion sites, Salon, uh, Talking Points Memo, uh, Huffington, but I'm wondering if the aggregator sites are not skewing the mainstream media, leading those horses to a lot of conservative neocon stuff. Mark? I recuse myself. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I wrote a book uh, recently that, that dealt with Drudge's power. Um, and Real Clear has a lot of power too, and they definitely lead more people in old media to stories that skew right more days than not, although not exclusively. Um, you know, in the, in the 80s and 90s, one of the big puzzles on the left was why is there not popular talk radio uh, with left-wing hosts? Uh, and to this day, there's only a handful of popular left-wing talk radio hosts and many conservatives. And I think, I think for people on the left, Huffington Post and some of the others you mentioned are effective aggregators. I, I think that, that Real Clear and Drudge have not been matched, not because of some difference between the left and the right and their attitudes on the web, but just because they got there first and they're very good at what they do. Um, so I agree with you that they skew the old media. Uh, and I think that it's difficult to break their monopoly. And I say that as someone who's trying. I mean, I, I would just say that I think Real Clear and, and Drudge uh, and Right Wing Talk Radio to an extent as well, because that was the, the first wave, um, answered a need in the marketplace, and that's why they took off. Um, to many people on the right, and I'm on the I'm right of center. Uh, the left wing aggregators were ABC News and CBS News, <laughs> and so having Drudge, which is uh, you know, it's the comparative reach is much smaller, um, what doesn't seem like an imbalance to us, and, uh, and I think that's why they took off in the beginning. I think that's why right-wing radio took off as well. And, uh, but certainly Drudge uh, drives news, but he also is not only interested in right-wing news or, or talking points, the reason he's been successful is because he's interested in breaking news and interesting news. So uh, it's not perhaps as, as slanted as it could be. I, I just want to go on record as agreeing with that point about, <laughs> about it filling a, yeah, a I think, need. I, filling a I think the danger, or maybe danger is the wrong word, but I think the significance of Drudge has less to do with right wing versus left wing, although he clearly has exhibited right wing tendencies at and times. And he loves polar bears too. Yeah. <laughs> really like pro polar bear. Pro polar bear, pro kitten. Um, but uh, I think the significance of Drudge is that he does like to break news, and in so doing, he creates a prisoner's dilemma of sorts between news organizations. And so if he you know, teases a New York Times front page for the next day, that's going to send all of the competitors of the New York Times into a tizzy to see if they should, A, chase it down, and B, um, you know, if they can chase it down, break it. And that sometimes leads to both rush journalism, where what the Wash, let's say, you know, not to demonize another paper, but a rival newspaper you know, chases down the story. Maybe, to, maybe Drudge teases it at 4 o'clock or 4.30 in the afternoon. They've got three or four hours before their first deadline set, and they've got to run and figure out if they are going to be able to confirm the piece. They don't know what the Times is doing at that point, so they decide to make a decision. They don't want to roll the dice and, and risk getting beat, so they, put it, put, they go with the piece and put it into print that either is incomplete, inaccurate, uh, perhaps not as detailed as it should be, lacks a certain nuance, and you get a, um, uh, perhaps a false report or a, or a somewhat skewed report that breaks into the zeitgeist. Oftentimes, when Drudge does that, uh, the New York Times will hold their piece, and it doesn't show up the next day. And so the only thing that's out there is the rival newspaper's effort. And I think that, in some respects, um, you know, bastardizes the process. You speak like somebody whose uh, experience is firsthand. OK. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, step up to the microphone. Now, the job of speechwriting, as I've observed it, in this campaign is somewhat different than it was for us. And I want to give you an example of why. I'd like everybody in the audience who has watched online or gone online to read a candidate's speech or position paper to raise your hand. That's the difference. There is now a way for candidates to break through with their entire message. 
I would bet, I won't ask you guys again, but I would bet that in a, most instances here, people have written, uh, gone online multiple times. I know I have. And so the soundbite and the gaming of the mainstream media becomes less important. And presenting the full case in a way that people who are looking at the full case has become more important thanks to this media. The bloggers have their day. All the others have their day, as you guys do. But the candidates have a capacity and an appetite from the public to present their full case, fully articulated, and with a lot of backup, because the position papers will have that. Would you guys Anybody respond to, to that? Um, I, well, I, I, I just, echo, just echo the point. I remember Governor Romney's uh, speech on faith in Texas in December was the next day, it was like the number one watched uh, video online uh, on a lot of these uh, video sharing websites. So, I mean, I, I just, just to echo that, I agree. Um, it was, it was, a, it was, it was, it was, we had an incredible ability not to, ju to reach people, j not just in that room, but beyond uh, with uh, new media technologies. I would, I'm so, so glad that you made that point because I, that's what I was actually thinking earlier uh, when we were talking about having sort of national serious conversation about issues. One of my favorite things about new media, including campaign sites, is that you can get that raw information when you wouldn't necessarily have been able to before. It was always filtered through a reporter. Um, and there may be things in a speech that I find important that the reporter actually didn't find that important. Maybe I'm interested in even more inane details of uh, whatever policy, and I want to talk about that with friends and, and understand that fully. I love being able to get raw information, and I think the appetite for it uh, is growing because people go and find those full speeches on YouTube all the time. Bill, what about from a Democratic perspective? Did you find that the media just exactly covered exactly what you want. Well, the challenge is I think it's got less to do with partisanship and, and just more to do with practicality because if you give a speech and you want to get on, I mean, the evening news is still the, 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 has, still has the largest audience with which to reach people. And so the challenge is coming up with the right soundbite that's going to get you, your, I mean, if you're lucky, you get a seven second, 10 second soundbite on the evening news. So the challenge if you're giving, if your candidate's giving a speech is to come up with the right soundbite that's going to get you that, you know, that shot on the evening news um, and you know you want to make sure that by that bite is going to encompass and summarize every the point that you're trying to make in that speech. So I think that challenge is still there. However, the internet does allow you, and sites like like FactHub, for example, allow you to allow the campaigns to provide that raw data, that raw information to those who want to follow up and get more information. It's one of the reasons why you often see, you know, Candidate.com on the podium uh, because when that seven-second soundbite is being broadcast on the evening news. It gives the viewer at home the opportunity to both hear the bite, but also to say, OK, I can go to this website and check it out. Another question. Um, you step up to the microphone. Hi, um, my name is John Stanford. I represent a PR firm from here. And I'm also part of this generation of new media. Um, and so I don't have a lot of experience with the old media, but it seemed when I watched the nightly news with sort of Tom Brokaw or now Brian Williams, the last five minutes is usually something entertaining, um, but the other 20 some odd minutes uh, is sort of policy messages in terms of the political arena that sort of get forced down your throat. And as you mentioned, um, it's now sort of that entertainment, um, sort of entertainment quality that sells the new media. So to what extent does there need to sort of be someone forcing new media to, to sort of push the message through? Because it's the bitter comments, and it's Bill Clinton rant, ranting about a magazine, and not the policy messages that seem to be getting through. James, what do you think? Um, I mean, for better or worse, that's what people want to see. Uh, I mean, we talk. We, a lot of people do watch political speeches online, but I mean, if it's a very successful YouTube video for a candidate, it'll get like a hundred thousand views, maybe a million views, and that's nothing compared to the people who are watching entertaining clips on the news or on YouTube or other things like that. Um, you can say cats roller skating. <clears throat> cats roller skating is very exciting. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, th this audience, I think, is probably very politically aware and in tune and is definitely going to go and seek out and watch those full length speeches. But most people won't. And most people, I think, just want to be entertained. And um, even though we, we, we live in Washington, but a lot of people just don't even really care about politics that much. And there is no one to force things down their throats anymore because now they can completely well, choose think, anything they want. Do you think that folks in the new media have any responsibility to try to, as, as I think this gentleman said, you know, sprinkle some medicine in with the entertainment or some information? 
It's an interesting question. When I was doing my videos in my dorm room, I was always trying to do kind of serious analysis, but I was always trying to throw in as well jokes and quick cutaways and stupid sound effects that I would make with my mouth because I had no sound effects machine or anything like that. And just to try and keep people involved and engaged. And the, the interesting thing is, like I never, I never, I never, like I said, I never considered myself a journalist. I never took a journalistic ethics course or even you know, thought of myself in those terms. So I didn't necessarily think I had any responsibility, even though people would tell me, you know, I, get, I, watch, I watch you and I get my political news for the day. And I would kind of think, well, that's kind of strange. You're not really getting all that much from me. But I guess that's what, that's what people chose to see. So the interesting thing is everybody can set the level of responsibility for themselves. And I'm, who am I to say to another blogger what they personally want to achieve with their blog, whether it's journalistic or otherwise? I'm, I'm fairly, as you may have noticed, I'm fairly laissez-faire about the whole situation. Um, from a blogger's perspective, yeah, you're, you're writing about what you want to write about. You're getting out the message that you're interested in covering. And I would argue that you know, the line is not exactly that you know, old media covers very responsible policy-driven news and, you know, and new media does Obama girl and kittens. Um, I don't think that's necessarily a line. There's a lot of very entertaining, you know, fluffy stuff on, in old media as well because they need to attract an audience. Um, but I think new media also offers some really, really detailed discussions of policy that you would not necessarily get in an evening news uh, format because it's just too short and not that many people are interested. But you put it on a blog and that person has a free blogger account and it doesn't have to make money. That person can write about education reform and education policy until the cows come home. And people will come to read it because there are people who are still interested in it. So I think there are opportunities there for very serious discussions that we can easily overlook if we're not careful. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges facing both, you know, both campaigns and all media is figuring out ways to transmit information about policies and uh, proposals in a way that's internet friendly. I mean, frankly, you know, we, you know, we talk a lot about the new media. I think a lot of new media is basically old media but on the internet. Um, and that's not really a, you know, I, th I think the challenge, and I think in many respects, we're in a very embryonic stage of new media in the sense that people need to figure out ways and campaigns need to figure out ways, newspapers need to figure out ways to produce content that is web friendly and that is not actually something that's emanating or, or that's, that's rooted in the, the old media principles. I mean, one of the reasons why I think a lot of newspaper print papers are having trouble adapting to the web is that they're taking a print-based approach to putting together their newspaper sites. And it's, um, you know, the content is basically driven by, okay, what's going to be on, our, on A1 of tomorrow's newspaper? And that's what drives what the website highlights. Um, and so I, just, I, I think that people, you know, the caucus, for example, um, you know, some of the newspaper, the larger newspapers are starting to you know, showcase their, their blogs in a way that, um, uh, subjugates what's in the, you know, the print stores are still there, but the blog is highlighted. And I think campaigns similarly need to start figuring out ways to put a speech up um, in a way that's not simply just, you know, putting up the transcript. They should do that, obviously, so the raw material is available to the public. But to make that speech interesting and to, and to communicate in more web-friendly ways that, uh, are, that, that, that break through. Anybody else on this? Well, I, I agree with I would agree with Phil. Um, I think um, the the information's out there again in, in a in a poll information economy. Uh, um, there is a, a, a tremendous amount of information for people out there to talk about issues. I think the big difference is is how one medium affects the other. Uh, nowadays, if something goes wrong on YouTube, uh, it then explodes on cable television, and there isn't a discussion. It moves past a discussion of bits about serious policy. Perfect example would be the bomb Iran uh, with, with, with John McCain. That dominated news coverage. It dominated a lot of the new media coverage on things like the trail, like the caucus, because it had nothing to do, because exactly because it had nothing to do with issues, and instead had to do with a campaign process. And in primaries, oftentimes, when you have candidates that essentially agree on issues, I think this was more prevalent on the Democratic side than anything, when you have candidates that are essentially identical on issues, it becomes about attributes and it becomes about process. Um, I think what has really changed, uh, two things have really changed with the new media. The first is the, uh, the, the, the speed with which things move. It used to be that a guy like Phil and a guy like me, we had until 5 o'clock to get our story together because by then people need deadlines uh, for tomorrow's newspaper and people need, you know, uh, the networks are in makeup. 
Uh, and nowadays, I, I remember sitting in, in, in senior staff meetings in the mornings at campaign at 930, where a national news reporter was saying he's about to post this on the web, and he needed a response from me at 9 o'clock in the morning. You know, I'm in a senior staff meeting. We're still putting together the message of the day, and I've already got a reporter who is assaulting our message. Um, I think, so I think that is, is, is really what's changed. And the other thing is instant analysis. Go and look at these, go back and look at these, these debates that we had and the live blogs, whether it was a, on a daily cost site or it was on National Review. And it was, you know, every utterance was instantly analyzed as devastating to her campaign. Or <laughs> he's going to lose social conservatives because he said that. He's going to <laughs> lose Ohio because he said this about, about uh, uh, manufacturing policy. And this is devastating to his campaign. Or he absolutely won the debate with that. And I'm looking at the clock and I'm like, we're 14 minutes into the debate. You know? <laughs> and so these live blogs, the instant analysis, it really has changed the tone and tenor with which uh, campaigns then uh, begin to develop a macro message. Uh, and I, I think it's really affected the campaign. I remember what, when, when I was done with the campaign, I was surprised how much more uh, clarity I had looking at the, the Democrat contest as it went on because I was no longer caught up in the minute by minute analysis of whether or not your message was breaking through during the campaign. One other quick thing, Kevin, you were saying to me, weren't you, a few minutes ago before we came out here, that the one difference in 04. Uh, you might, you know, as the senior communications person on a campaign, it might be your job to talk to oh, yeah. some of the main, yeah. give, give that quick example. Well, look, I think if you were to go back to the campaign models of, say, 1992, when people were still pressing send on faxes, I mean, imagine, imagine those days, it's like watching a guy walk down the street with an 8-track tape nowadays. But, um, you know, if you went back to 1992, you know, the national press secretary dealt with the, 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 the lead reporter from the New York Times and probably dealt with the network, uh, the network anchor himself when it came to shaping news stories or giving response to news stories. I was struck by how during this campaign, I would literally have somebody like, you know, a Dan Balls, who's a, a very influential national reporter from the Washington Post, on the phone one minute. And meanwhile, while I'm talking to him on the phone, I'm typing to a blogger who's demanding a response from either, you know, TPM or, uh, you know, National Review or any of these other websites. And I was struck, I was struck by just the duality of that, the fact that I'm here talking to a national old school reporter and at the same time I'm typing out to uh, a blogger who may, has nowhere near the journalistic credentials that a Dan Balls has. So it really did just change the way uh, press secretaries work on campaigns. It's fascinating. All right, next question. My name is George Scoville. I'm with the Information Technology Association of America. Um, I know we're talking a lot about the dichotomy between new and old media, so I'll try to stay away from jokes about the new candidate and the old one. Um, there's a, sort of a school of thought that's emerged that Barack Obama, um, with his employment of technology in the campaign, has sort of revitalized the process. And uh, John McCain's website is kind of clunky and difficult to navigate, too many links to follow, um, so on and so forth. And here we are at this panel uh, talking about this very kind of thing. Um, my question is for Phil and Kevin, uh, as sort of tech gurus on political campaigns, did you guys find yourselves um, targeting specific demographics because of the media that you were using? There seems to be um, uh, a whole lot more young people involved with the uh, Obama campaign, and, and certainly nobody wants to criticize McCain for running a bad campaign because the larger portion of his fundraising base are probably not Gen X and, and Y sitting at home watching videos on YouTube. Uh, could you address that? Bill? You want to start? Well, first, I wasn't the tech guru on our campaign. If I were, it would have, uh, probably would have ended uh, much sooner than it did. <laughs> um, but what, we, what I found, I mean, I think there are two ways to sort of answer your question. Um, you know, one is, how do you use the internet? We, you know, what I, I work with the press. So I would use the internet and internet reporters and bloggers and whatnot as a way to influence the press. So for example, if um, I was trying to get a story you know, in Paper X, I might, you know, call Mark Halpern up and try to get something, you know, going on on the page about um, an endorsement or, you know, use his site as a way to tease a, uh, an NBC or a Washington Post into covering, into covering whatever it was that I was selling that day. Um, the other way to do it, obviously, is to do direct voter contact using the, using the Internet. And um, for sure, I think that there was, there, were there was a concerted effort and a concerted strategy to use the internet as a way to target um, specific voters and do that. Um, I'm more expert at the first. I'm less expert at the second. So I don't want to BS my way through it. Um, 
but uh, certainly, you know, there was you know, there was a strategy involved in terms of how you leverage the power of the internet to reach your, your target voters and to uh, communicate with them. Kevin, uh, well, I, I I think it's a great question. There's there's a, there's a lot of um, there's probably has more to do with the, like the social networking uh, aspects of a campaign versus the messaging of the campaign. Um, I know that uh, again, like Phil, I was not I'm not a tech guru. I was just really good at listening to the tech gurus and copying and pasting what they said. Um, but I think that the, the, the <coughs> audience, the, you can Sorry. tailor messages to those audiences, and that was the, one of the great things about the technology is that you could tailor these messages to your audiences and develop a message through coalitions. So, for example, if you were giving a speech uh, to, uh, or you wanted the governor's policy, or you wanted to bring together people who were, uh, say, essentially motivators on an issue like the Second Amendment, you could then tailor a lot of your networking and tailor a lot of your, uh, your messaging to those unique audiences through your, through your website, through your coalitions, through social networking sites like MySpace or uh, a Facebook. Um, I, th I think that answers, I think that yeah. answers the question. Yeah. That's good. Anybody? All right. Yes. Hi, my name is Drew Clark, and I run a website called broadbandcensus.com. Each new medium that's come along has affected the previous one, whether it's the news magazine affecting newspapers or radio and television changing the role that newspapers play. And we've heard about kind of two cross-cutting trends in this panel about the role of political journalism. On the one hand, the web has enabled kind of a return to the days when newspapers actually competed head-to-head -head for news on an hour-by-hour, edition-by-edition basis. But on the other hand, uh, is, is the future of, of, a, of a mainstream newspaper like the New York Times or the Washington Post going to be more in its analysis and the depth of the coverage that it can give to a particular event? Uh, so I, I really would be interested in the panel's thoughts on whether uh, the mainstream media or the media is going to be more driven towards the you know, reactive, uh, immediate news or more analytical. Why don't we let Mark and Mary Catherine and James come in on that? Well, whatever it is, it has to be economically viable. And I don't know that there's a, a market, a mass market, uh, to uh, pr provide just analysis. Uh, you have to have the economies of scale, if you're in the New York Times or Time Magazine or ABC News, to have reporters around the world, to have a general counsel who can fight the government for access to things, to, um, to, uh, to publish around the clock now. And you can't just be in the analysis business to do that. You've got to be in the 24-hour news business. You've got to be in the video business, probably. You've got to be in the entertainment business. Um, if your corporate parent, parent will allow you, it would be helpful to have uh, something like being in the sports, pornography, or gaming businesses to provide some other revenue. The Washington Post company is, is now in the education uh, testing training business and publishes a newspaper on the side, but their revenue comes from Stanley Kaplan. That's a good model, too. Then you can do more analysis. But if, you, if your main revenue is going to come from your journalism, I don't think you can just be doing analysis. You've got to compete in all those other areas. You can specialize as part of a, a niche audience doing analysis, but that's not enough to be economically viable if you're going to be a big national, international organization that does serious things. You I, I, mean, I would argue that for, and I've, I've never been somebody who thinks the new media will replace old media at all. I'm like a, a fourth generation newspaper journalist, so I kind of um, love the old media despite some of its, its problems. Uh, but I've always thought the killer app for old media is investigative reporting, and yes, it takes some money, and yes, it takes some time, but analysis and opinion and all that kind of thing anybody will do it for free. I mean, many, many, many people will do it for free. Not that many people are able to do the serious reporting and be overseas and, and be getting those stories on, on a regular basis. So I've always thought that that's, that's what uh, old media new organizations need to lead with. And uh, obviously, they're having trouble in the marketplace. Uh, but that's, that seems to me the key to surviving is, is uptaking that. And uh, so what they said, plus the, I mean, Facts have, are basically a commodity, and analysis also is increasingly a commodity because any, almost, if you read most mainstream sources, generally like after a debate or something, most people will say the same thing. And I've, I've learned on the campaign trail that's partly because kind of all the journalists who cover things hang out together. Um, but and so you can get those things are, are, are commodities, and I think just adding to this statement of what it takes to be economical and survive, you have to just do something different. You have to have a different opinion and, and of course, back it up, or you have to wrap it, uh, wrap it in some kind of entertaining or provocative package. You have to differentiate yourself. And maybe 
uh, you know, part of the problem that we see in, uh, in, in financially with old media now is maybe some consolidation is necessary, maybe even unfortunately more than has already happened because in the past there was, a, there was more of a market for all this, but since it's kind of people largely view it as the same information, they don't necessarily um, all need to exist at the level that they do anymore, which is kind of sad in many ways, but again, uh, possibly the reality. Okay, next question. My name is Dimitri Epstein. I am a doctoral student at Cornell University and trying to make sense of... I'm sorry, what university? Cornell University. Cornell. Okay. And I'm trying to make sense of all the things that we are talking about here. And Good luck with that. Thanks. <laughs> well, I have a few years ahead. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about information. And uh, the, you mentioned, all of you, that there is a lot of information out there. And my question has two parts of it. Because on the one hand, there is a lot of information that, out there for us. Instead, we're missing a thousand of news items by sitting here and not being online. Um, what does this wealth of information do? Does it actually drive people to learn more about uh, the subject? So it's actually drive them away uh, you know, and to rely back on other factors that determine how they're going to vote. I don't know if you have any information about that. On the other hand, there is a lot of information about us out there, and this is maybe more to people who were involved in the campaign, and I think what makes it campaign probably the 21st century campaign is the data mining tools that have imp improved since the previous election cycle. So how this technological investment was factored in the campaigns, if you have anything to say about this and how basically micro-targeting and um, all these techniques. Okay, did, did you all understand the second? I got the first yeah. part of the question. You got the second part. Well, I, I think the, 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 the core observation that every campaign uh, probably balances, uh, the fulcrum upon which every campaign balances its communications effort is the, in a new media world is the idea that in a world where there's a wealth of information, there's a poverty of attention. So with that poverty of attention, how do you tailor messages to, you know, uh, to unique audiences? And um, now, with, with, you mentioned with data mining, you can now find out, based on the way people purchase certain things, whether or not they're Republican and whether or not it influences their vote and who they're going to vote for. So um, a lot of that has to do with new technologies beyond just your traditional, traditional messaging for, via a spokesman like Phil or I, you know, putting a soundbite onto uh, television or in the newspaper, but instead using, um, uh, I, and Mindy Finn, who's going to be on the next, uh, next panel, will be able to explain this. She's the Athena of the, of the Internet new technology and how you do this. But um, the ability to put those out into uh, using the technology to reach those voters in their email boxes, reach them via a blog ad, reach them via a, uh, a story on a website, reach them via your own website and your YouTube. So that, those are all the new technologies that are now being deployed. I bet you the next panel will probably be a lot better at talking about it. But, but at the core, what you balance your communications uh, uh, plan on in this world is, th is exactly that. Uh, idea that in a, in a world full of, uh, where there's a poverty, uh, where there's a wealth of information, there's a poverty of attention. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that um, the central goal of any effective campaign is going to be to reach the people who are hardest to reach, uh, who vote. Um, they may not necessarily watch uh, the evening news every night, they might not read the New York Times every morning or the, day, or the local paper, but they can be relied upon to go out to the polls every two or four years and the challenge for you know, a candidate running for office is to figure out ways, creative ways, to hit those people and make sure that they are getting their message. Um, and data mining, a lot of the new technologies, makes that process easier. Um, you know, another piece of the process is figuring out who the, who the influentials are in a given community. Um, it's sort of like that, what's that, uh, the Malcolm Gladwell uh, book. Um, right. well, the, uh, the, one, the, the one person who can find 10 people to go to vote yeah. with them. Right. Right. And sometimes that manifests itself through an, a website that is widely read in a particular community. Other times it represents itself through the local guidance counselor who everybody you know, goes to for advice. Um, or the basketball coach that's been in the community for 30 years. Um, so... And the just to follow up on that, the constituencies out there that are the key motivators. That's why oftentimes you see, well, people don't people care about gas pri gas prices. Why why are, why is the campaign talking about the Second Amendment? Because in many of these communities where you're trying to target your vote, it's the Second Amendment voter that is the influential. 
he's the person you can go out and get 10 people to vote for your candidate because he cares so much about your candidate's position on a key issue like the Second Amendment. That's why I think Barack Obama's comments, the, the bitter comments that, that, uh, uh, that so much coverage, it generates so much coverage because people who are, people, uh, faith and Second Amendment issues are incredible motivators in a lot of these key swing battleground states. Okay, I think we've got time for just one more question. Hi, yeah, I wanted to uh, follow up on a comment made Tell before. Tell us who you are. And uh, who yeah, you I'm Paul Rodriguez from NCTA. And, um, I'm sorry, from what? Uh, Paul Rodriguez from NCTA. NCTA. You thanks. talked about the ability of, instead of just giving a, a speech to a room and 250 people, you can sort of expand that. Um, Mike Turk's analysis of why the Thompson campaign failed was, well, you know, why do you have to spend all that money traipsing around doing pancake breakfasts and diners when you could just use the internet to get your message out? And the result was, of course, Thompson got no traction. Everybody called him lazy. So uh, if there is this balance between uh, old school politics of going out and traipsing and doing all the traditional things and the new politics, um, keeping in mind that they're intertwined because, for example, if you're doing a ground floor, get out the vote, 50 state strategy, using online tools helps you do that more effectively. What's the balance this election cycle between old school and new school? Does that automatically keep shifting from one to the other and do we reach a, a tipping point? No, it's or will it reach, it'll yeah. reach kind of a, a perfect equilibrium of Old school stuff you're going to have to do in perpetuity forever, but with a lot more new school stuff kind of interlocked. And I think we're dipping into the territory of the next panel, but by right. all means. But who's, who's to say this. you can't marry the two? Why not have a camera set up in the back of the room of the pancake breakfast and live stream it? The technology's there. We did it very often with, with the Ask Me Anythings that we used to do. There would be 150 New Hampshire residents in a room just asking questions from everything about um, I need my road paved to what's your position on the Second Amendment. Uh, the camera in the back of the room put that uh, on video so that we could put it right on our website that very day so that you weren't just limited in the 150 people in the room at the pancake breakfast. But instead, there are now thousands of people that can either watch it live via the, the new technologies that you have, uh, or, or millions who you, you can then take, a, put, you can take that video that you also have, put it on YouTube, and send it around. If the governor made a particularly good point, if you had a, a particularly um, strong moment uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with a constituent, and, or, or for example, if you set up that day's messaging to hit one of your opponents, Within an instant, that link in the send, you, the, the send your link society, we would send it. We would send it around to reporters. But is the lesson of Thompson don't skip the pan, don't skip yeah. step well, look, one well, of showing up at the. You got about breakfast. if we had like another three hours, there's probably a lot of things we could talk about with and the we're Thompson campaign. We're going to be talking about some of this okay. in the next. Briefly, the next briefly, I would argue that that I think with the Fred Thompson campaign and what I've heard from people who worked on the Fred Thompson campaign is that the new media strategy is where he wanted to go. He wanted to go all out that way because he didn't want to do the sort of shoe leather kind of thing. He didn't want to do the traditional thing. So they tried to go that way, and then there was a decision in the middle that was like, oh, we're not really going to go that way. So they didn't go either way. And that, <laughs> so I don't, I'm not sure it's a, a new media problem in that case. But I think the two always have to be married. It, you're not going to get voters out without talking to people. All right, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who, uh, when, when he was once asked if he had to choose between a government without newspapers and newspaper without a, without a government, he said, I wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. I'm sure he <laughs> would say the same thing today about the new media, right? All right, you want to thank this wonderful panel. Thank you all. You've been terrific.